great to be here. And I know, I know that I'm between you and your cocktails. So we'll make this as fun as we can. Um, before we get into the stuff I've got to share with you today, we should probably just get it out there. What the heck's a futurist? Because it's kind of a bullshit title. What does that mean? Uh, it doesn't mean that I spend time in a darkened room smoking peyote and thinking great thoughts, right? It, it, it's a real discipline, and it, it's about looking at the confluence of trends over time. Technology trends, I worked at Intel for 30 years, so I'm deeply steeped in where technology is going. Thinking about business trends, how, what, how will business use this technology? How will technology solve real business problems? And that's my bread and butter. It's translating from technology to business impact. And then finally, thinking about what do people need? What do they love in life? What are their relationships like? What are they scared of? What are their aspirations? Putting all of those together to figure out what will be possible at two years, five years, 10 years, 15 years in the future. So I don't suppose to know your business better than you do. So I'm not going to try and tell you what the future of, uh, of out of home is. Uh, but I just wanted to offer a few thoughts on how is technology going to change our lives in general? And what are some ideas I have about how that might affect your world? The big picture here, and I share this with, I work with the energy industry, the telecoms industry, manufacturing, healthcare. Uh, the big picture I tell all of my clients is that the digital world, which we know increases in capability exponentially, is being ever more intimately connected with the physical world that we live in that allows more value to come from the digital world into the physical world. Now, that's not a new story. That's, that's something that's been going on for about a 30-year process now. What is new is that there are six technologies that are becoming mature in this next decade that collectively will create ever more intimate connections between the digital and the physical world. And that provides huge opportunity for every business on the planet. It also means that businesses that have traditionally not been reshaped by technology, industries that have been largely resistant, to some extent retail, for example, certainly construction, agriculture, are going to be increasingly automated and semi-automated and transformed by technology. What I want to do is run you through some of these technologies and how they might change the world that you live in. So I'm not going to talk about blockchain. I think that's a very interesting one. That's a two-hour workshop that I do is just talking about blockchain. I think that will affect the way that uh, ads move through and it'll probably reduce intermediaries over time. But I wanted to talk about the other five, 5G and satellite networks, autonomous machines, the Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, and augmented reality. So let's just dig into each of those. As I understand it, you know, one of the challenges you have is when you're putting digital signage in place, Typically, that sign is going to be there for five or 10 years. How do you monetize that? How do you find more revenue streams to monetize that sign over that five to 10 year period? Sure, you can display ads on it, but there's other things that you could be doing too. So some people are looking at working with munis municipalities to figure out how do we um, maybe put amber alerts on there. Maybe we had to put information on there, which is useful to uh, people in the community. But there are other ways to start to monetize these physical investments too. One of them is, as 5G is built out, how do you uh, maybe think about not just installing a digital sign, but installing the infrastructure in with that sign to make it into a 5G mini cell, so that you can start to sell that service to a Verizon, to an AT&T, to a Vodafone, whoever it might be, uh, to be able to monetize that physical asset over time, in addition to all of the information services and ad services that are flowing through that screen. It's not just 5G, though, that is going to reshape the communications world. 5G is a very powerful technology. It's, it's one more G, right? So it must be better than 4G. It's going to be 10 to 100 times faster than the 4G connection you have today, but it has other characteristics that make it far more reliable, uh, much what's called lower latency, which means when you ask for a signal from the internet, it comes back lickety split, and much more um, resilient, so it'll scale much better in large cities. This is going to enable a whole new set of applications that are going to be a big demand for 5G. It's not just another G. Uh, and be able to put those kind of capabilities to help these uh, communications companies build out their infrastructure is going to be a business model that you should consider. But beyond 5G, 5G is still not going to get out into rural environments. It's still not going to get out into rural Africa, for example. And so the next thing beyond that is satellite networks. 
And there are a number of companies, you see them, the logos listed here, who are putting major investments in place to build satellite constellations. These satellite constellations will take a signal up from Earth, across through the network of satellites, and then down to another point on Earth. It's actually faster than fiber. So largely, Wall Street is going to pay for this infrastructure so they can get a signal from a trading room in London to a trading room in New York faster than running fiber underneath the Atlantic Ocean. But the secondary effect of that is it's going to be able to connect the next four billion mines on planet Earth. So here's another opportunity for you. Instead of putting a 5G hotspot into um, a 5G cell into your signage, maybe, and this is a crudely created sign that I, I did on the, on the plane on the way here, maybe you can have a satellite down into the, into the signage and then spray out 5G and spray out Wi-Fi to all the people around it. Think about the next three billion, four billion consumers in the world who are not in particularly highly connected environments, you have the opportunity now to go into those environments and be the beginnings of not just an infrastructure, but to be able to start selling messages to them, helping guide them as they develop those economies. We are on the edge of um, transportation transforming from being a hardware product that you own to a largely software-run service that you use. Autonomous vehicles are going to be starting to come into market. First cars, 2021. Uh, the data says that by 2030, the price difference between a, an autonomous car and like a dumb car drops to the point where they become a no-brainer, that everybody starts to just get autonomous cars. And then by 2040, almost every car on the road is autonomous. And what does that mean to everybody in this room? Well. As we're moving from A to B, we're not driving anymore. So there's other things that we want to do. And we're likely to summon the car that we want based on the thing that we want to achieve while we're in the car. So in this picture here, you see people kicking back and watching a movie as they move from A to B. Here's another example. This is a business-oriented car where people are doing a business video conference while they're on the move from A to B. Now this means that there's an opportunity to sell streaming services and advertising into these moving vehicles and to maybe even use that as a way to reduce the cost of people making these journeys. Sometimes I share stuff and people say, well, no, that's not going to happen, Steve. Of course it isn't. Well, yes, it is, um, because the world is imp you know, changing capability at an exponential rate. Let me give you an example. This is a real program that's being done by a Chinese-Swedish company called Wheelies. Um, it's a, a product called MobiMart. Uh, and they're doing um, uh, testing on this in Shanghai. The model is this. I can see you're all big nightclubbers. Right? You study out, start out of the nightclub at 2 AM. What is, I've got the munchies. So you pull out your phone, and you summon the mobile store. It comes slowly to you through the night. The store opens up, you go inside, you pick out the goods that you want, get your munchies, maybe buy a pair of shoes. You pick your stuff, you go out again, and then the, the store moves off to the next person. This is really in trials now in Shanghai. I'm not making this stuff up. Right, so these autonomous platforms are not just about taking people from A to B, but bringing services to people. So think about how could you be bringing services with your brands to people rather than expecting them to come to you. It also means that these types of things, which you see is particularly driving around the streets of New York, don't need to be driven by a human anymore. And maybe the cost point for these mobile signage uh, installations goes plummeting. Here's another business model. This is uh, a company called Eceptacle. They make trash cans, and they sell these, well, actually, they give these trash cans to municipalities. These trash cans have, they're supported by ads. You see there's a screen on the side here. So they, they, they run ads day in, day out. These have additional features which municipalities really like. They use artificial intelligence and microphones uh, inside the trash cans to listen for a particular sound. And that is the sound, sadly, of a gunshot. As soon as it hears the sound of a gunshot, it activates the cameras that are all around the trash cans. And it tells all the trash cans in the neighborhood to do the same. So they hopefully can find out what's happening and send those feeds direct to the local police force. The Internet of Things is fundamentally about putting sensors into the world. SAP estimates that by 2030, 
the world will be filled with 100 trillion sensors. Now, a sensor is anything from uh, a temperature sensor, an accelerometer, a microphone, a camera. You can even use a Wi-Fi hotspot as a sensor. Those sensors allow the physical world, or the digital world, to understand what is happening in the physical world, so it can help act upon that. If you use artificial intelligence almost like a lens on that filter, you can start to do some amazing things and see the world in even more detail and to see things that human eyes cannot see on their own, that humans can't see on their own. There's lots of um, interesting applications in healthcare. I want to sort of give you a little glimpse of that and then start to think about what could this mean for your world. And I think this, this creates this notion of super sensors. This is an experiment that's going on with uh, MIT Media Lab. Uh, they are looking to develop a sensor for um, looking after people in assisted living. So people who are elderly, uh, living in a home, and you want to be able to watch them and keep an eye on them without using a camera, which is invasive. So this sensor you see on the wall here, just like a Wi-Fi hotspot, but it's a little bit less energy, about 100 times less power than a Wi-Fi hotspot. What it does is it sends out radio frequency signals and they bounce back, tend to go through walls and bounce back of people. The signal that you get back is just this messy blur. It doesn't mean anything to you or me, but you put that through an AI, you train it to understand what that signal means, and in the time we've got, I can't explain exactly how that works, but you train this AI, and it is able to pull out images of people. It's able to understand and use that radio frequency signal as a camera, without it being a camera. Not only can it figure out the images of people, it can also measure their heart rates, their breathing, and in a clinical situation, in an assisted living facility, it can measure people's sleep states. So it can tell if they're in REM sleep, deep sleep, and so on. So these sensors can be incredibly sensitive and give you insights and information that you would not expect. So this is sort of bleeding edge technology. I think the opportunity here is to think about from a privacy perspective, how could you use a sensor like this as a camera that would mean that these people are happy, right? You, everything that you do needs to be uh, making sure that you are GDPR and uh, California Consumer um, Privacy Association uh, compliant. So this may be a way of doing that. Now, I'm a futurist. I'm telling you stuff that's coming in the future. But this is something to watch and watch closely. Final thing I want to finish up with here. How many of you have tried one of these? Virtual reality. OK, a few of you. This guy's obviously having a great time in this photograph. Let's not ask what he's looking at. Um, but virtual reality surrounds you with a digital world. Um, that's interesting, but what's interesting, mo most interesting to me is augmented reality, where you are blending digital content with physical reality. Now, in this case, this is technology. If you think about Wall Street, uh, I mean, the movie Wall Street with Michael Douglas, 1987. He has that scene where he has a gigantic phone as he's walking on the beach. And we all thought, wow, that's cool. Well, now it's turned into one of these things, right, a few years later. We are at that Michael Douglas Wall Street stage right now with augmented reality. The technology is not quite there yet. Apple strongly rumored to have devices in market beginning next year that will give us these types of experiences, blending digital content into the physical world that we inhabit. It means the next display is the physical world, not a physical display. It means that your next TV might be a 100-inch TV that you buy not from Costco, but a 99-cent app on the App Store. What it means is that ads can be augmented and improved over time. So you might have an ad for everybody, and then that ad comes to life and has additional personalization and interactivity added to it through the glasses. It also means you need to be paying close attention. Because as you put all of this effort and infrastructure into creating these beautiful displays, and I know the big ones cost a ton of money, the person that gets closest to the eyeballs wins. If Apple creates a beautiful pair of glasses that allows them to lay things over the top of stuff, your beautiful display can easily be edited and you can slide other ads that Apple's paying for right over the top of them. So you need to be making the alliances now with the tech companies who are building these things for when that time comes to make sure that you are the one that's getting closest to people's eyeballs. 
So to wrap this up, I think where this is going, we've heard a lot today about uh, programmatic stuff, making sure that uh, these displays are addressable, accountable, attributable, the three A's, right? that you can find the right person, the audience you want to get to, that you know that you reach them, and that you know that not only by reaching them, uh, but they went out and actually activated and, uh, and, and converted as a result of seeing your ads. That's clearly where the thing is going in the shorter term. Longer term, I think what we're talking about is ways to add additional services into these displays so that you can get paid and monetize that real estate in other ways. I'll give you the 5G example as just one example. Thinking about these displays by using sensors to not only be pushing messages out, but using that as a way to make it a bi-directional conversation, to be able to understand what is happening in the world and to pull that information in and do something interesting with it. And longer term, be thinking about the fact that your displays might start to become virtual. And if augmented reality takes off, as I think it will, uh, the same way that you know, augmented reality is not there yet, when the very first smartphones came out, people were like, eh, we'll see how that goes. And suddenly this is the primary device. This has become the remote control of modern life, right? This eventually will take over from the cell phone. And the cell phone will still be there, the same way the PC is still there. But uh, this is going to be the new world that you're going to be faced with five, ten years from now is going to disrupt the industry. As a futurist, I would be bad if I didn't tell you that. So I really appreciate your time. If you found this useful, uh, I have a book coming out early next year. That's what it's called. And uh, if you ever need to find me, that's how you find me. I'd love to help you anytime I can. So phew, we made it. It's cocktail time. That was great, Steve. Wow. You you and Laura kept everybody, not a person moved for the past two sessions. So by the way, thank you, Laura, and thank you, Steve, this fabulous predicting our future. Um, how does that store move to get to you in Shanghai? It's completely autonomous. It finds its way around traffic. Just along traffic the roads, and, like yep, an autonomous along the car. Roads. Yeah, there are people also just doing ones that will um, follow the pavement and follow you on the sidewalk. Wow, really? um, There are people in California. There's one that's doing a grocery store. How do you make that, that scalable? Around. Uh, you just build more of them. Okay, yeah, I guess so. Right? You don't need drivers. It's, uh, it's right. all autonomous. Right. Um, the only thing you need in terms of labor is people who will stock the stores. So they go back to a central depot, they get stocked. And that may again. end up being automated too. Mm -hmm. Back up and it just throws it in. Yep. Um, this is great. We have six.